Lord Volume 7 Chapter 2 Chapter 02 Butterfly Entangled in a Spider's Web Re Translated by Nigel Proofreader Editor Deus Ex Machina Part 1 The sun had not yet risen, but there were already quite a number of workers gathered in the Count's courtyard. The last people to arrive were Hecron and the members of Foresight, for a total of 18 people. All of the people gathered for this job were capable workers within the Imperial capital. Each team kept a fixed distance from the others. And at the same time they sized each other up warily, so the fact that every single eye went to the members of Foresight as they arrived last was quite an intimidating sight. Ah, there's a few familiar faces. Speaking of which, didn't we meet that stag beetle at the Cat's Plains? Strange, didn't I mention it at the inn? Gringham's team was hired too. What, I didn't tell you. I have the feeling that I brought it up. In any case, as you can see, all the notable workers in the Empire are gathered under one roof. A warm round of applause for our clients' ample finances. We can dispense with the applause, I think. Let's leave that aside for now. The ones over there should be the team leaders. Everyone present was divided into their teams, and among them, a group of three people were discussing information. Gringham's there too, right? Okay, I'll go over to say hi. Ah, Yuga, that bastard's here too? Seriously? Then, those elf girls must be. This is terrible. Die, you son of a bitch. Amina muttered bitterly to herself. She might have been keeping her voice down, but Hecran and the others still panicked as they surveyed their surroundings for signs of hostility. Amina San. I know, Rober. He's a colleague for the duration of this job, after all. But I just wish I didn't have to see his face. I don't like him either. Ah, if you want to talk about whether or not we like him, then I hate him too, but you need to mind your attitude. A look up. You're really annoying, came over Amina's face. Hecran came between her and Robert Dick, then smiled mischievously as he shrugged. Hey, I'm going over to greet him. Don't say annoying things like that. What if I end up showing it on my face? Work hard, leader. After hearing Robert Dick cheer him on, Hecran deliberately scrunched up his face and grumbled. Those two talk like it doesn't concern them, and then went over to the group of three people. The first to greet Hecran as he walked over was a worker in a suit of steel-colored full-plate armor. Due to the strange, rounded structure of the plates and the curiously oversized pauldrons, he did not look like a human being so much as a beetle standing on two legs. A large horn stuck straight out of his helmet, a sign that he was deliberately cultivating that image. However, the part after that was not intentional. The man's legs were very short, so he looked like a stag beetle that a child had deliberately forced to stand on its hind legs. A nicer way of putting it would be to say that his short, stumpy legs stood securely upon the ground, and he had a dwarven physique that was well suited to being a warrior. As I expected, thou cam to, Hecarin. Yes, Gringham. I thought the terms this time round weren't too bad. Hecarin waved to the other two people. His attitude was hardly dignified, but neither of them looked unhappy. This was because the four of them might have been of different ages and had different experiences, but they were equally skilled as workers. So, your guys. Hecarin glanced at Gringham's team and counted them before replying. There's only five of you. What happened to the other members? They're taking their rest and alleviating their fatigue. In addition, they worked the same assignment as myself, and now they must repair or replace their damaged or destroyed panoply. This man Gringham led the team called Heavy Masher, a large worker team with 14 members. There were merits in having numbers on one side. One of them was the ability to approach a job from many different angles, which gave one many ways to handle a job. In particular, the ability to recombine into a team that could take on any request was a great boon. However, that approach also contained demerits. One of them was the fact that payment was divided among the number of people, and so each individual would be paid less. The second flaw was that deciding something would take a very long time, which led to slow movements. 
After adding up the pros and cons, the fact that this man could group up workers and their tendency to break apart based on personality conflicts, and then go one step further to perfectly control them was a sign of his great skill as a manager. Oh, that's tough. Although, why don't you act as our support, so the friends you left behind won't end up hating you for earning too much? Utter foolery. As a leader in mine own right, the task falls to me to assuage the underlings once the task is concluded. Regretfully, our band must seek the best possible outcome for ourselves. Oi oi, don't be like that. I'm just saying that it'll be fine if you speak normally around us. Gringham smiled thinly. Hecarin saw that he did not agree, and so, he shrugged and turned to the other man. This is the first time I've spoken face to face with you. He extended a hand to the other man as a show of respect, and that man took it. His was a sturdy and strong hand. His narrowed eyes flickered, then focused on Hecarin. Foresight. I've heard of you. His voice was as clear as a bell. One could say it fit his appearance very well. You too, Tenbu. There was nobody who did not know of this genius swordsman, who was undefeated in the arena. This man's team Tenbu was essentially a team composed of one man, to some extent. However, that was also why Amina's face contorted with disgust. I'm glad to be able to team up with a sword genius who can rival the mightiest warrior of the kingdom the great gaze of Stranoff. Thank you. However, shouldn't you say that he can rival me, Eruya Uzruth? Oh bold words. Eruya smiled coldly, an arrogant look on his face. After seeing his expression, Hecron blinked several times to hide the emotion he had nearly revealed. Well then, I look forward to seeing your swordsmanship on full display in the ruins. Yes, you can leave that to me. I hope there'll be a monster in those ruins who can give me a challenge. Eruya patted the weapon at his side. We don't know what kind of monster may emerge. For all we know, we might even encounter a dragon. Now that would be a frightening sight. Perhaps a powerful monster like a dragon might challenge me. However, I'll win in the end. Really now? Hecarin smiled, albeit on the surface. He glanced to see the reaction of the last person, and worked to suppress his own feelings. He recalled a rumor going around that in swordsmanship alone, Eruya was more than a match even for an Orichalcum ranked adventurer, so perhaps that answer of his was no idle boast. In addition, confidence in his own abilities was a good thing. Bragging was very important for workers. Of course, that was as long as he did not take it too far. Dragons were the mightiest species on the world. They soared through the sky and expelled ruinous breath from their maws. Their scales were sturdy and their physical attributes were extraordinary. Old dragons could even use magic. They possessed a lifespan incomparable to those of human beings, and even a sage would have to admit defeat to their accumulated wisdom. Due to their power, stories frequently depicted them as wicked foes, or beings who lend a hand to heroes. The objective of the Thirteen Heroes' last adventure was the dragon known as the Divine Dragon. In much the same way, the final adversary of a hero was often one of the Draconic race. It was quite startling how he could compare himself to such a powerful being and act so cockily, even if it was idle banter. His swaggering tone sounded like he was joking, but unfortunately Eruya's eyes were serious. How full of himself was he? Nobody knew what sort of monsters lay within the ruins they would soon be visiting. He predicted that Eruya's mental state was very dangerous and might end up dragging down everybody else as well. That ought to be the case. I'd better stay away from him. It was his own business if he wanted to die, but it would be troublesome if he came over to beg for help. Hecarin smiled to him, and having made that decision, he amended his approach to Eruya. Now he would be used and then discarded, and the people over there should be the members of Foresight. Oya, a look of disdain and scorn filled Eruya's eyes the moment he saw Amina. Apparently, Eruya had been born in the religious nation that revered humanity as the greatest of all races. The slain theocracy. 
The citizens of that country often viewed people with non-human ancestry as second-class citizens. From that man's point of view, having a half-elf like Amina working on an even basis with him must be very upsetting. That part of him lends truth to the rumors. However, if he really was born in the theocracy, then he ought to have a baptismal name. There's also a rumor that he abandoned his baptismal name. Hecarin grumbled in his heart, and just to be sure, he muttered, Oh aye, aye, hands off my buddies, okay? Of course. For the duration of this job, we are all comrades. I will work together with you. I would very much like to believe those words. This man Aruya was like a strong kid who had directly become an adult. He unnerved others. Or rather, he was mentally unbalanced to some extent. The mood around him was distasteful to others, and even after reminding him, Hekron could not find it in himself to relax. Oh yes, please believe me. Now then, let's return to the previous topic. In any event, I'd like to turn overall command of the expeditions to someone else. Provided it's not too troubling, I will obey the instructions of all the other members. Feel free to use me as a vanguard during battle. I will cut down all the foes before us with this blade. All right, understood. In that case, I'll be returning to my team. Let me know if there's anything. Eruya bowed, and then left. As he saw the women waiting for Eruya, Hekron's face twisted for a moment. However, he could not let his feelings be written on his face. Allowing others to know how he felt might occasionally prove disadvantageous, and someone like that was not fit to lead a team. He quelled his emotions, and hid his expression. He turned away, like he had seen something filthy, and greeted the last person. Greetings, honored elder. You're as healthy as ever. Hoy, Hecarin. You seem well. He wheezed whenever he spoke, because almost all his front teeth had fallen out. He was Palpatra, Green Leaf Ogrion. The source of his nickname was the suit of armor he wore, which resembled green leaves glistening with morning dew. That armor was not made of metal, but the scales of a green dragon. Palpatra and his team had once succeeded in a dragon hunt. Of course, it was not a very big dragon, but even a small dragon was not a foe which an average worker or adventurer could handle. Palpatra was an old man who was in his 80th year of life. Usually, people in this line of work retired after the age of 45. There were also some who would retire in their early 40s. Very few people remained as adventurers after the age of 50. The people who work such a cruel job where death was a very real danger could not ignore the effects of age withering their bodies. In truth, Palpatra was an exception, but his strength had deteriorated greatly from when he was in his prime apparently, when he had reached the level of the Orichalcum ranked. Even so, Palpatra refused to step down from the front lines. Palpatra and the way he continued adventuring despite his advanced age was an object of admiration for many people in the field. Ahem, still, he seems a little dangerous. Even more wrinkles appeared on Palpatra's already wrinkled face, and he lowered his voice, a gesture of which Hecran approved. Yes, if he wants to die, that's his problem, but I'd rather not go down with him as well. Granted, he is very strong, but excessive confidence might end up endangering his compatriots. He is extremely dangerous. Gringham seemed to be muttering something along the lines of, How troublesome! After seeing Aruya's attitude probably all the workers were thinking the same thing. Actually, how strong is he? I haven't been to the arena in a while. Knowst thou not? I am aware. Is it not the same for thee, revered elder? I've only heard of his prowess, but I haven't actually seen it with my own eyes. Perhaps I could ask my companions. However, when we get down to it, what are we going to use as a benchmark for strength? For instance, if we used Gaze of Stranoff as an upper limit, then where would something we were more familiar with? Like say, the Empire's four knights stand on that scale? The knights here were also known as Heavy Explosion, the Immovable, Lightning Bolt and Violent Gale, huh? Using them as a benchmark only complicates things. 
the four of them ought to be inferior to that great man to the kingdom's warrior captain but then, the days of gaze of Stranov towering over the common herd are a thing of the past. As time goes by, new powerful warriors will emerge. So you wanna say Uzruth is one of them, that he's really that strong? Besides, I've never seen the power of the four knights up close. The strongest person I've seen is probably the leader of the Platinum Imperial Guard, who answered directly to the Emperor himself. That man's skill is quite something. As I recall, he's on par with the Four Knights. The mightiest in ties I know of are the Dragon Lords of the Council Alliance. Humanity cannot defeat foes like those. Some say there's five of them, others say there's seven. A. We're looking for a way to gauge Uzruth's strength. Please limit yourself to human swordsmen. That said, the Agrand Council Alliance's swordsmen are almost all demi-humans, so we'll have to count them out as well. The Martial Lord of the Arena is the same way. Then I'll cite the Lady Paladin of the Roble Holy Kingdom, who wields a holy sword. That said, she does seem somewhat inadequate in terms of pure swordsmanship. Collecting information on mighty individuals was very important for a worker, when it came to handling jobs. That was because the presence or absence of such information often determined victory or defeat. And of course that aside, they were all warriors, and they could not help but want to know more about people who inhabited the world of martial arts with them. It was the same now. The conversation had started by discussing Eruvio's strength, but things had gotten more and more heated, and it became something like a swap meet for news about powerful beings. It was like a group of kids arguing about who is strongest. The slain theocracies people tend to be of a uniformly high level, but I haven't heard of any particularly outstanding individuals among them. Then again, even if they were, divine magic casters are outside the scope of this discussion. I heard there's a female warrior in the kingdom's highest-ranked adventurer team. What of her? Ah, the? No breasts, just pecs. One, am I right? She's very strong. Although, I heard that she lost a duel with a warrior captain. I heard an adventurer addressed her with that made-up nickname and got beaten half to death. Ha, what a frightening young lady. After mentioning the names of the strong, I've come to realize that there aren't many powerful pure swordsmen. There's Dark Knight of the Heroes of the City-State Alliance. Then there's Flash, Cerebrate of the Draconic Kingdom's Adamantite-ranked adventurer team Crystal Tear, as well as Crimson, Optics of the Worker team, Blazing Inferno, and then the Kingdom's Brain on Glaeus. The conversation stopped here for the first time. Brain on Glaeus. Who's he? Palpatra directed that puzzled question at Gringham. Dost thou not know, revered elder? That man is a famed swordsman of the kingdom. What about the? Hecron shook his head in response to that question. He had never heard that name before. Verily, all of thee know not. Gringham could not hide the look of disappointment on his face. Then, he spoke in a voice that lacked confidence, like he was perusing memories of the past. This is a matter of years gone by, when I once took part in the Kingdom's Grand Martial Tournament. During the semi-finals, I had the privilege of measuring his blade skills a measure. At that time, mine abilities could not hope to compare to his. You're talking about the tournament which Gaze of Stranov won, right? Indeed. In the end, Unglaeus met defeat at Stranov's hands, but the battle of those contenders was truly a sight to behold. They were paragons of swordsmanship both. How did he deflect that flash of light? And being able to strike with but a single curve of the blade under those circumstances. Mine eyes were opened upon witnessing such sights and more. Given the way, Gringham was gushing with praise for him and the fact that he could fight evenly with Gaze of Stranov, the mightiest warrior of the surrounding nations, it was clear that his strength must have been top-rate. So it was just that he did not know that the world contained such skilled exponents. Hecron was filled with awe. Um hum. Then, who do you think is stronger, between that Unglaeus chap and Uzruth? Uzruth Gringham answered without any delay. If he had to battle Anglaeus from the Grand Martial Tournament, it would definitely be him. 
I witnessed a fight of his in the arena recently, and I am certain of it. So that means he can stand on par with the warrior captain from several years ago. Is he really that strong? Oh my! Hecarin had exclaimed in a moment of excitement, and he hurriedly lowered his volume. I see, Unglaeus, is it? Looks like I'll have to pay attention to news from the kingdom. All right, have you two heard of it? That there's a third Adam and tight ranked adventurer team in the kingdom. Of course I have. Ah, pardon me, I haven't. Hecarin, ignorance will endanger thy team. I know that, but I just don't have the money to gather information about our friends in the kingdom. I can't spare the cash. Yeah, 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 how bold. I do not dislike such courage. Revered Elder, I seek your opinion on a certain matter. Having heard the rumors of Darkness Mon, do you not feel they are far too exaggerated? They say the two of them slew a gigant basilisk, without the aid of a healer. You uh, it ought to be just a rumor. Such a mighty foe, a gigant basilisk, could not be felled by just two people, not even if they were Adam and tight ranked. Thou agreest with me then, Hecarin. The more news I gather, the more dubious the provenance of such. It has even reached mine ears that during the great uproar in the kingdom, he dispatched a fiend of well over two hundred difficulty in but a single blow. To me, that might be a fabrication concocted by the Adventurers Guild of the Kingdom to frighten those within and without the nation, and thus they granted those people the rank of Adam and Tite. That's possible. After all, the birth of a high-ranking adventurer is a momentous occasion. Still, would the Guild tell such lies? The Guild is quite stubborn about the way they do things. The Guild Master of each city handles things differently. The guild master from my adventuring days was filth. So I punched him right in the face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a worker now, thanks to that. Palpatra laughed loudly and with good cheer. His reasons for becoming an adventurer were well known. Anyone in the business within the Imperial capital would have heard of it. Palpatra would repeatedly recount the incident whenever he sat down to drink. That said, I feel the guild wouldn't do something like that. So you think it's true, then? It's hard to believe. Even if you viewed it in the most generous terms, a difficulty of 200. That number alone is suspicious. Any foe who was that powerful could not possibly be felled in a single blow. I think that part was an exaggeration that was deliberately spread. If an extremely high difficulty demon really did show up, they probably engaged it with multiple teams and then had darkness deal it the finishing blow. That sounds more likely. Well, if you counted all the adventurers who are stronger than Orichalcum rank as being Adam and Tite rank, I could believe such a mighty warrior existed. After all, Adam and Tite rank can cover a very broad range. Hecarin and I are of one mind, but thou feelst it is true, do you not, revered elder? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't consider it to be entirely true either. Seeing is believing, as they say. I wish we could meet the man himself. Then again, maybe not. Just as the other two were expressing their agreement with Hecarin, they heard the sound of flesh striking flesh, followed by a woman trying to bite back a scream of pain. All the workers present turned their eyes onto the same spot. Several of them had already lowered themselves into battle-ready stances, believing something had happened. The source of the scream lay before Aruya one of his female companions, who lay upon the ground. Judging by the circumstances, Aruya had probably punched her. The woman looked up at Aruya's face, which was twisted in anger. Her own face was filled with fear as she begged pathetically for forgiveness. Hecarin fought back a rising wave of nausea, and a thought flashed through his mind. He hurriedly turned his attention towards his companion Amina. Just as he had imagined, her face had gone blank. There was a dangerous air around her, as though she would launch an attack if things went any further. Hecarin hurriedly signaled to Robert Dick and Arky who were standing beside her, telling them to hold her back. Personally speaking, Hecarin was as angry as Amina was. However, he could not stick his nose into the problems of other teams. Of course, he could do so if he wanted. 
However, if he did, he would need to be prepared to bear all the consequences of that choice. That was the reason why the other teams simply wrinkled their brows in displeasure, but none of them made a move. Amina's reason eventually overcame her desire to fight, and she spat on the ground after directing a lewd gesture at his back. The only thing he has that's comparable to the kingdom's warrior captain is his swordsmanship. It would be wonderful if his character were similar to his as well, but I guess that's too much to ask for. Alright, we'll stop here for now. Indeed. Since Hecran's here too, let's decide the most important thing. That man refused, so who'll be our overall leader? The three of them fell silent. There were four teams present here. While all of them possessed ample fighting power, without someone to coordinate and lead everyone, they would not be able to take effective action. It was like having many arms but being unable to use them all at the same time. Little different from only having one. Being able to make effective use of a team of strong personalities was not an easy task, and doing so without complaints from anybody was even more difficult. If the instructions resulted in failure, or if others thought that one was placing their own team's gain above their own, it would incur the wrath of the other teams. Frankly speaking, the position demanded excellent skills, yet there were more demerits than merits to taking it. Every team leader understood that point, so they all remained silent while watching each other's faces. Each of them wanted to dump this burden onto the first person to open their mouth. After about a minute's silence, Hecran tiredly suggested, Honestly, we don't need an overall leader, do we? That's just delaying the inevitable. It'll be troublesome once fighting breaks out. Mine idea is that we should alternate. That way, resentment will not accrue. I feel we may discuss the matter at greater length upon reaching the ruins. Ah, you do have a point. Both of them approved of Gringham's suggestion. In that case, we'll go in order of when we arrive there. How about Uzruth and his ten boo? It's fine if we skip that punk. Besides, he won't be able to do it. I agree, revered elder. Then, as the one who proposed it, my heavy masher shall take the lead. I'm counting on you, Gringham. Please do, young man. Understood. That said, there will hardly be any vicious monsters within the Empire. The problem lies within the kingdom. A situation may arise once we draw near the Great Forest. Ah, if I'd known I'd have reversed the order. Hecran made a show of grabbing his head in mock regret, while the other two smiled quietly. After that, they immediately quelled their facial expressions and turned to look at a man who was walking towards the workers. The surrounding workers had already turned to face him. The Count's butler walked proudly through the courtyard that was dimly lit by the brightening sky, with a pose that befitted a servant of a Count. He arrived before the workers, and bowed. Nobody responded to it, but he did not mind. Instead opening his mouth and saying, It is time. My thanks to everyone for accepting my lord's request. We shall dispatch two drivers with you and six adventurers as an escort. The objective is an unexplored ruin within the kingdom very likely to be a tomb, from the structure of it. The duration of the expedition will be three days, and the bonus will be awarded based on what my master learns, so we will arrange later on. Are there any questions? The butler had said the same thing as the employment request. The only difference was probably the presence of adventurers as bodyguards. They wanted to know how the Count had learned about the ruins, but the workers knew which questions could be answered and which questions could not. If their employer was willing to tell them, then he would have said so when hiring them. Besides, if this job was really so clear-cut and above board, adventurers could take care of it. Since it was dirty work, the employer had to keep quiet, and so not asking would be safer. In that case, I shall take you all to your awaiting carriages. Nobody objected, and so everyone followed behind him. Hegrin and the rest of Foresight were at the end of the group. That fucking son of a bitch, why isn't he dead yet? How about it, wanna kill him? Amina could not tolerate Aroya and she whispered her displeasure into Hegrin's ear the moment she was beside him, in order to vent her anger. 
Her voice was very soft. There was no telling if it was because she was utterly furious or because she was trying to restrain herself. Hecarin did not know, and could only hope it was the latter. I've heard it before, but he really is a crude man. He's absolutely disgusting. The other two replied quietly, making no attempt to hide their displeasure. It was only natural that Forsyth would think that way. With a woman like Amina as their companion, there was no way they could tolerate Aruya's actions. Aside from Aruya himself, the rest of his team was all female, and they were all elves. Amina and the other team members would not have been revolted by him if that was all. However, there was a reason why they had the unanimous and unreserved opinion that Aruya was a piece of disgusting filth. The elf girls were minimally equipped with crudely made gear. In addition, their short-cut hair exposed their long elven ears, which had been cut in half at the middle. The reason why Aroya's team members were like this was because they were all elven slaves from the slain theocracy. The previous system of slavery in the empire had undergone a great reform under the previous emperor. They were still slaves in name, but their situation was completely different. However, just like the demi-humans in the arena, the conditions of some slaves had not been improved. The elf slaves Aruya had in to belonged to that type. The three nations of the Baharuth Empire, the Riestai's kingdom and the slain theocracy were almost all human, and they discriminated more heavily against other races than the other surrounding nations. Thus, even humanoid species like half-elves and elves had a hard time living in these countries. Only the dwarves were an exception. The Azelijan mountain range that stood between the kingdom and the empire contained a dwarven kingdom. And due to the trading relationship the empire had with the dwarves, they were assured of protection under the law. I feel sorry for the elves. However, we should not try to save them now. Amina sighed heavily. She understood that fact in her head. Her heart was simply taking longer to catch up. Let's go. Amina moved to the head of the group after that quiet reply, and the others quickened their pace so as not to fall behind. Then, their eyes all went wide in surprise. There were two large covered carriages waiting at the place where the butler had taken them, which would be heading for the ruins. There was also a group of people helping to load their luggage onto the carriages. Those ought to be the adventurers that the butler mentioned, because the metal plates around their necks glinted with a golden light. However, what surprised them was not the adventurers, but the horses pulling the carriages. Sleipnirs! Someone exclaimed in surprise. The eight-legged Sleipnirs were larger than an average horse and possessed excellent physical strength, stamina and mobility. Some people considered them to be the ideal creature for land travel. Naturally, they commanded a startling price as well. Most nobles could not afford a mount that cost five times as much as a war horse. Yet, there were two two-horse carriages before them, for a total of four Sleipnirs. Their employer must have considered the risk of losing them during adventuring, and so, his determination was very admirable. Or could it be he felt that they would unearth so much treasure that only Sleipnirs would be able to move them? Everyone was probably thinking the same thing. The sound of swallowing came from somewhere. Please use these carriages. Your rations and other supplies are inside the vehicle compartment. In addition, we have hired adventurers to protect the carriage and your campsite. According to their contract, they cannot enter the ruins, so please keep that in mind. Hecarin realized that there was something which needed to be resolved right away, and so, he left his companions and ran to Gringham. Pardon me, Gringham, I need to discuss something with you. What troubles thee that thou seekst my counsel? When it comes to allocating carriages, could you put a separately from ten boo? Hm. A. I. C. Thy concerns are known to me. Thou fearst for that young lady, hm. In that case, we shall travel with ten boo. Sorry, and thanks. You're a big help. Pay it no heed. In this endeavor, we are comrades. A quarrel even before reaching the ruins would be a thorny matter, and I too am. Are you sure we'll be fine with these puny gold-ranked adventurers? 
I don't want to come back to a wrecked camp or wake up to find myself sharing it with monsters. A great shout came with all the force of a fireball. Two people stared at each other, and tensions were running high. Aroya expressed his dissatisfaction to the butler, but he did not make any attempt to lower she volume. The adventurers stopped moving their luggage, as though time had stopped. When one looked up, one could see higher realms A.E.A.D. Whether or not one could reach those heights remained to be seen. Yet, some people continued marching toward their goal, one step at a time, and Aruya's statement was very displeasing to those people. They were engaged in a struggle to prove their strength. And once their competency was called into question especially if their client doubted their ability it would affect future tasks that they were assigned. In that case they had to prove their worth in a simple and quick fashion. This man, whose words could not be tolerated by either the adventurers or the workers, did not know how to consider things from the perspective of others. Therefore, he was virtually unaffected by the foul mood in the air, and continued babbling to himself. No, I do understand that they're fit to handle our luggage, I'm simply concerned that they won't be able to help us get rid of threats. Give me a break. What good does it do to ruin the mood? Granted, they're here for work, so they should be able to bear with it a little, but still. Level-wise, all the worker teams here were on par with Mithril-ranked adventurers, which meant that they were better than these adventurers. However, some things ought not to be said out loud. Someone, anyone, punch him to shut him up. Several of the workers had evil glints in their eyes, and they were exchanging glances. Hecran hurriedly ran over to Amina. No matter what happened, he could not let her draw her blade. However, the person who came to stop this was not a worker. You must be used Ruth Sama, him. I assure you that there will be no problems. Are you saying that on the assumption that we're helping too? I could understand it, in that case. No, that is because there will be a stronger individual traveling with you Mon San. A warrior in full plate armor poked his helmeted head out from one of the carriages, as though in response to the butler's icy tones. He had probably been in the middle of moving a luggage onto the carriage. Allow me to introduce you to the Adam and Tite ranked adventurer team of two, Mon San of Darkness and his teammate Nabe. The two of them will travel with you and defend your campsite. I trust you will be able to accept that? The air changed again. The pinnacle of adventurers and workers, those who handled this sort of work now stood before them. None of the workers could speak in the face of this proof of absolute strength. The adventurers regained their good spirits as they saw the workers' naked reaction to the most highly placed of all adventurers, and they went back to their work. A man who looked like the adventurer team's leader smiled, and then spoke to the dark warrior. We'll handle the rest. Monsan, would you mind interacting with the workers? Being that you're our leader, I hope that you will discuss our security posture with the workers. All right. As long as your team agrees, I'll take on this task, despite my lack of ability. However, I believe you should be the ones to take charge of security. After all, you're more numerous, so it would be more convenient to follow your lead instead. Ah, no. What do you mean by a lack of ability? You're being too humble. Besides, how could we disregard the great Monsan? No, insist that you be in charge of security. Then, I'll be counting on you to skillfully command us. Nape. Mon chuckled softly, and then lightly descended from the cabin. An astoundingly beautiful woman followed behind him. When a beautiful woman showed herself, people would sometimes make a commotion out of shock. However, once her looks exceed a certain threshold, said people would not even be able to do that much. In the face of true beauty, all people could do was allow their gazes to be stolen away. Hecarin, he's, um, Rober, I'm thinking the same thing too. We saw him before, at the North Market. That man is, Mon of Darkness, and his sole companion. When you look at his mighty form, perhaps the rumors of him beating the giant basilisk were not so exaggerated after all. Giga, is what you say really true? So I heard, 
In addition, I heard Gringham say that he took out a difficulty 200 demon in one blow. That can't possibly be real, a difficulty of 200 isn't in the realm of possibility for a human being. Could it be that you misheard 100 as 200? Even 100 would be quite amazing. But how shall I put this? After seeing his words and actions, I feel like it's the truth. He had grasped Mon's character from his brief interaction with the leader of the gold-ranked adventurers. He felt that the man exuded the dignity and charisma befitting an Adam and tight ranked adventurer, which naturally endeared others to him. Before we mingle, I have a question to ask you. His voice was soft, yet its rich tones allowed everyone to feel his heroic spirit throughout his armor. Why are you going to the ruins? I know you've been hired. But you're not like adventurers, who find it difficult to refuse a strongly worded request. Why would you, whose actions are not bound, choose to accept this assignment? What drives you to do such a thing? The workers looked at each other. They hesitated over who should answer, and in the end, it was someone from Palpitra's team who spoke up. For money, of course. It was a perfect answer. There was no better reason than that. The workers had not hesitated over what answer they should have given, and Mon should have expected such a matter-of-fact reply from them. The fact that he had still asked the question anyway left them at a loss as to his true intentions. After seeing the workers murmur their agreement, Mon continued asking. That is to say, if your client pays you a great deal of money, it's worth paying with your lives. Indeed. Our client offered us recompense that satisfied us. In addition, there might be a further prize depending on what we find within the ruins. It is my contention that such largesse warrants the risk of our lives. That answer came from Gringham. I see. So this is what you have all decided, then? I understand. Please forgive me for asking such a worthless question. Such a trifling matter requires no apology. Do not allow it to weigh upon thy heart. Ya ya ya, well, if you've finished asking, might I ask a questioning turn? Please do, old sir. I wish to verify a rumor I've heard. They say your strength is extraordinary. May I see if those rumors are factual? I see, seeing is believing, after all. Of course you may. I shall show you my might if it means you will accept my... No, our protection. Then, how shall I demonstrate my power? The best way is to spar with someone else, of course. All eyes gathered on. And of course, I'll be the one to do the sparring, that's right, me. What? You, old sir. My apologies, but I am not accustomed to holding back. I do not wish to harm you, yet I have no confidence in restraining myself. Do you mind? Ya 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 ya. That's Adam in type for you. Not a thought given to the fact that I might hurt you instead. A quiet chuckle came from under the helmet. But of course, old sir. This is the difference in our respective strengths. I am strong, stronger than any of you. That is why I can bear the name of Adam in tight. Despite his extraordinary arrogance and sense of superiority, it did not displease those who saw it. This must be the presence of the man called Mon. His statement overflowed with persuasive power in addition to a frightening puissance that could slay countless foes. How incredible. Yes, he's just too amazing. The feverish murmurs rose and fell. Many women adored strong men. In terms of respect, many men were fascinated by strong men. They were like moths mesmerized by a flame, and for those who lived in a world of blood and steel, great power was the flame in question. They could not tear themselves away from the charm that bound them, even though they knew that they would be immolated if they must judge their distance. Ya ya ya. I doubt anyone will doubt that you're Adam and tight ranked now. Still, speaking of which, it's rare that that we get a chance like this, so I'd like to get a few pointers from you. The carriages here will get in the way, so could I borrow that patch of empty ground, Butler Dono? After receiving permission, Palpatra led everyone to the courtyard. It was not just the workers who followed him, but even the adventurers and butler as well. Given the revered elder's skills there's probably no way he can do it. 
That man seems very strong. Im rather than say he is strong, it would be better so say that the divide between them is precipitous. Even the two adamantite ranked adventurer teams in the Empire would hardly qualify as superhuman. You have a point there. Silver Canary's members have very exotic professions, so they each have strange skills, but their overall abilities fall below people with basic jobs. And I hear that the members of Eight Ripples derive their strength from their numbers and teamwork. Silver Canary was led by a heroic bard, and its members all had exotic vocations. Eight Ripples was a nine-man team. Due to their numbers, some said that their strength was not yet at a tight level. But others also said that as long as they worked together to focus on a problem, they could handle problems which even other Adam and tight ranked adventurers could not tackle. However, whether or not those two teams qualified as the secret weapons of the human race, those who could make the impossible possible, the strongest in Tice, Adam and Tite, remained in doubt. Hecarin said all that after hearing his teammates whisper from behind him. The three of them were not the only ones doing so. If one listened carefully, one could hear the rest of them discussing various topics. The most repeated question was how long Palpatra could hold out. Nobody here felt that he could beat Mon, because even after their brief time together, everyone had acknowledged that the aura around Mon was most fitting of an Adam and tight ranked adventurer. Hecarin thought as he walked, and just then, someone came to his side. After hearing the noise of metal armor, there was no need to ask who it was. Gringham, how do you think their fight will turn out? While saying so might upset the revered elder, there is no doubt that Mon will win. Beyond that is the question of how long the revered elder will endure. Wilt thou not K behind the revered elder? As if, give me a break. How about you? Permit me to humbly refuse. Witnessing a superhuman warrior in action is more than enough for myself. Although, I would not object to a few lessons on swordsmanship from him during the course of our journey. Same here. Mon and Palpatris stood before the two of them in the courtyard, maintaining a distance between and looking at each other. Palpatris' eyes were not those of an ordinary old man. They were those of a veteran campaigner. The aura around him had hardened into needle-like killing intent, and the air held no trace of this being just a regular old spar. Everyone present broke out in a cold sweat, their hearts filled with uneasiness. Hey, this is pretty bad, right? The old man's serious. Beside him, Gringham had reverted to his original way of speaking. Well, his opponent's an Adam and tight ranked adventurer, so he's got no choice but to be serious. Still, Hecran shifted his eyes towards the dark warrior standing off against the old man. Having just spoken those words, he immediately drew a breath. He could not sense anything from on. His arms drooped down, he looked completely unguarded, and he did not look like he was about to fight a duel of blades. He was as composed as an adult looking at a child holding a sword. Amazing, he's not reacting even in the face of such powerful bloodlust. There's no way he couldn't have sensed his opponent's killing intent. So this is what the supreme perfection of warriorhood looks like. In other words, the supreme perfection of emptiness. Is this what they call no heart? Or the realm of clouds and water? He's so calm despite the difference in their weapons. He must be extremely confident in his skills. A. I want to throw myself down before him in a TL note, both of these are terms from Buddhist philosophy, no heart refers to a lack of obstructive thoughts while clouds and water refers to moving and flowing freely. Palpatra was holding a magic item whose point was made from a whittled down dragon's fang. In contrast, Mon held a staff he had borrowed from one of the adventurers. It did not look magical in any way. Magic weapons had all sorts of special effects, from improved sharpness, improving their wielder's abilities to doing additional damage and so on. Right now, Palpatra had an overwhelming advantage in terms of armament. No, that's probably not it. It's true when it comes to weapons, but the enchantments on Monsan's armor ought to be stronger than the old man's. 
his other magic items ought to be of a higher standard too. Overall, I'd say they're either pretty close or Monsan has the advantage. Art thou not too hasty in thine judgment? Hast thou not heard that the magic items the revered elder carries are worth more than an adamantite ranked adventurer's panoply? The revered elder has completed countless jobs over the years. One could say he was the best paid man in the empire. No, wait, wait. Thou shouldst come thyself. As the two of them argued, the ever-rising urge battle loss led to the beginning of the duel. Then, shall I go first? There's more pressing work to be done after this. Don't push yourself too hard, come at me in a more relaxed way, old sir. Without letting Mon finish, Palpatra instantly stepped in with a smoothness, speed and power that an 80-year-old man should not have possessed. In contrast, Mon had not even raised the staff in his hand. Dragon Fang thrust. Hecarin, eyes went wide as he saw Palpatra open with a martial art without the slightest bit of hesitation. The technique made his spear's shaft curve, allowing him to stab twice, like a dragon's fang. In addition, it could deal elemental damage on top of that. This was a development of the martial art, thrust, being a technique which Palpatra had apparently developed over 40 years ago, and it had become widely known due to its excellent balance. Many other warriors had learned that move up till this date, and among the Dragon Fang Thrusts, Palpatra had chosen the Blue Dragon Fang Thrust, with the additional effect of dealing electrical damage. What's that old coot thinking? We might have healing magic on hand, but nobody would use a move like that under normal circumstances. A move like that, which could inflict electrical damage on the merest grays, was ideal for use against an armored opponent. Palpatra's use of that technique was a sign of how deadly serious he was. However, Mon easily avoided that strike, which would have otherwise been the bane of someone in armor. Even in his jet-black full-plate armor, his movements were as graceful as a feather. More astounding was the fact that he had not leapt away, but remained in place and dodged it while hardly moving at all. That's impossible. What kind of dexterity and motion tracking vision is that? Gale Acceleration. Palpatra continued using his martial arts. You've gone too far, old man. Has your brain gone senile too? Dragon Fang Thrust. He used the same move from before upon Mon again. Snow White Freezing Vapors shrouded the spear's tip. It was the White Dragon Fang Thrust. That lightning fast series of four attacks. A great commotion rose from the onlookers. That was only to be expected. After all, not a single one of those four attacks had managed to so much as touch Mon's armor. Palpatra leapt back. His forehead was beaded with sweat. He was not exhausted from attacking, but the mental strain of wielding his spear on deadly ground had been too much for him. He's incredible. He's stronger than Hegrin. But of course, Arky. Don't compare me to him. He's what they call the highest level adventurer, the peak of everything. That's the power of an adamantite ranked adventurer. Now then, I believe it is my turn next. Mon slowly raised his staff into a middle stance. In contrast, Palpatra took the spear he had been clutching and rested it on his shoulders. That was not a fighting stance. It was the posture of a man who had lost the will to fight who had given up the battle. That was incredible. I give up. My skills can't even land a scratch on you, much less beat you. Is that so? Oh. Gasps of awe rose from the people watching by the side as Palpatra announced his surrender. It was a truly overwhelming display. They had all seen with their own eyes a difference like the one between children and adults. The crowd debated excitedly, discussing what school his dodging footwork hailed from and so on, sharing the emotions within their hearts. Hecarin paid them no heed and took Gringham with him as they went over to Palpatra, who was wiping his sweat off as he spoke with Mon. Is it over, old sir? Mon's tone in the air around him had turned gentle. Don't tell me you're about to show your true power now. Ya ya ya, my, you speak quite harshly to an old man. That was my true power just now. What you saw was the full extent of my abilities, Mon Dono. 
Ah, forgive me. I was being rude. Please don't apologize. That would fill me with shame also. You don't have to be so stiff when talking to me, because our worth isn't measured in our years, but in how skilled we are. Having a matchless man of power like yourself defer to me makes me feel a little itchy. I see, then I shall dispense with the formalities, however reluctantly. That said, I'm not quite satisfied with ending things here. If we do get another chance, I'd like to make the first move instead. Now then, I still have to help move the luggage into the carriage. I'll see you later. Moving luggage is a trivial task. You could hand it to someone else, right? Surely this can't be your job. I don't think so. No matter what position I may hold, I must still do the job assigned to me. With those words, Mon returned to the carriage, trailed by that beautiful girl. The two people who met them in passing watched them leave. They looked at his mighty back. Hia ya, judging by your expressions, you seem to have something you want to ask. Revered elder, what did thou think of that exchange? His wrinkled face twisted. It looked like a bitter smile, and at the same time like something else. That man is very strong. No, as an adamantite ranked adventurer, strength comes with the territory, but I honestly had not expected him to be that powerful. From the instant I faced him, I had the feeling that every blow I struck would be blocked. Hecarin felt the same way. He had also felt that any attack he launched would have been easily blocked and promptly countered by the man called Mon. And even if everything had gone according to plan, he could imagine how his strikes would have been deflected by that armor. Palpatra had faced him head on, so surely he must have felt that even more intensely. So that is an adamantite ranked adventurer. Indeed, that is an adamantite ranked adventurer, one who belongs to a realm which only those favored by the heavens may dare to tread. Ah, what a matchless beauty, a pinnacle to which we cannot hope to aspire. Say, you must have been happy just to glimpse that peak, no. Indeed, watching from the sidelines, I could see thy movements clearly. If I was facing them in person, surely I would not have been able to observe his skill so calmly. Personally, while this may offend thee, revered elder, I would have very much liked to see Mondono's strength as he went from the defense to the offense. That's impossible. Mondono had no intention of attacking me at all, I couldn't sense any fighting spirit from him. It was probably like he said, he sucks at holding back. He must have felt that if he had actually struck at me, he could have easily taken my life. If that were the case then one could say Mon's thinking was very arrogant. That was because the old man Palpatra was a skilled warrior, yet Mon had scorned him without so much as looking at his moves. However, it was because he could do such a thing that he could be called an adamantite ranked adventurer. It can't be helped, the difference between his strength and mine is far too great. At first, I was unhappy too, but then he ended up taking the defense, and evading all my strikes. What could I say after that? That was what it meant to be strong. He had used a weapon which he was not familiar with whose balance and weight were completely different from what he normally used to show how confident he was. That was the difference between the two of them. Palpatra whined. Ah, so tired, so tired, then turned his back on them and left. Naturally, he was headed for the carriage. As he watched Palpatra leave, Hecarin heard a quiet grumble. Even when I was young, I could not step into that domain. So that's Adam and Tite. What an unattainable peak. Palpatra's back shrunk in his eyes. In contrast, Mon's back seemed massive and oppressive. That is the highest rank that of Adam and Tite. Yes, it's truly amazing. Nobody around them could dispute their odd words.